Good evening. We give you a warm welcome to Greenock Town Hall. And we pray that God is going to bless you tonight. We pray that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to fall on this place. And that each of us is going to have an encounter with the living God. Hallelujah. You excited about being here? Praise God, so am I. It's hard to believe, isn't it? I'm excited about being here. It's wonderful to see you. We give you a very warm welcome in every part of the building. And we pray you will know God's touch and his blessing and his power as we meet together to worship together uh, tonight. Let me remind you of a few up and coming events. Tonight at 10 o'clock, we have our youth service. If you are young, okay, you judge. If you are young, you can come along at 10 o'clock to our special youth event and join with our young people as they worship and praise and magnify God. If you know any young people, send them along tonight. Tomorrow, we have a couple of seminars. Uh, we've got the ladies' seminar here at 10. We've got the businessmen's seminar as well at 10. It's not in here. Don't know where it is. We'll find out for you. And tomorrow night, in the Port Glasgow Town Hall, we continue uh, with uh, Port Glasgow Town Hall uh, on Saturday and Sunday evening, where we'll continue uh, Unfortunately, without our brothers and sisters from America. Everybody say. Because the local team are going to take over where this wonderful team have finished off. Amen. I've been asked to introduce Pastor Carter Conlon to you tonight. <laughs> wow. That never happens for me. <laughs> Pardon? Can't hear you. Stop heckling. <laughs> this is Greenock. <laughs> Praise God. He asked me if we could do something Scottish tonight. So as you leave tonight, everybody will receive a deep fried Mars bar, which you will really. No, I'm only kidding by that. No deep, ba no deep fried Mars bars uh, as a Scottish treat. It's just too much for the cholesterol to cope with. But we are going to do something Scottish. Now, out there somewhere, we've got a fantastic number of, of visitors with us from America, but we've got a tremendous amount of people locally supporting the event. And what we are going to do is we are going to do something um, to bless the Times Square Church team because we're going to sing them a traditional Scottish hymn. So I googled... What can we do for a traditional Scottish hymn? And could I find one? No. But praise God, during the time and just after the time of the Covenanters, in the 16th century, when they needed to worship God, what did they do? They went back to the Word. This country at one time was known as the land of the Bible. And they went back to the Bible and they took the Psalms and they paraphrased them and they made some wonderful hymns. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come mine aid. My help it cometh from the Lord, whom heaven and earth hath made. But we're not singing that one tonight, because the local team, we're going to treat them by singing probably the best known hymn in Scotland, and that's the Lord's My Shepherd. Now I want you to sing this as a, as a celebration, a thank you to the team for coming across here. So I want all the local people, wherever you are, I want you to stand up right now. The words are going to appear behind me. And we're going to start singing The Lord's My Shepherd. Now, I know many of you know, know harmonies and melodies and everything else. And I want you to sing it with all your might and all your gusto. Thank you. I just want to start off by saying that I so want to rightly honor my parents and I love them. But um, throughout my childhood, I've known the Lord since I was six years old but I've known great suffering and um, a lot of dysfunction and a lot of just really sometimes hell on earth. Um, my dad was a, a severe alcoholic and many times in our home it was never a place where you wanted to be. There was a lot of death and destruction. I've watched my mom try to commit suicide. I've seen it, my dad hold a gun to his head and just saying it's not worth it and there's no reason to live. Um, but since the age of six, I am now 26 years old, and I've always known God. I've always known the grace of God, and I can honestly say that he's always 
walked with me and talked with me and he's kept me despite all the things that I faced as a child day in and day out. And I remember at the age of 16 when the first time I could look at my father and say that I loved him. My dad came home from really just a drinking binge and he came to our house and my mother had just had it and we were actually packed in the car my younger sister and I and all of our belongings and we were leaving and we were gone and my dad as we were actually literally pulling out in the driveway he comes to the house and he pleads with us he gets down on his knees and just cries out in agony and just asking for forgiveness and I remember looking at my dad and was just For the first time, I had compassion on him, and I had a love that I had never known. Because for so long, I blamed him for my discomfort, and I blamed him for the pain that I had experienced. And I realized for the first time in my life that he needed God, too. That he didn't want to be doing the very things that he was doing, or the pain that he had caused my family. And I learned in that moment to have hope in something greater than the situation. You see, we can't look at our circumstances to find hope and reasoning. We have to look up and we have to look to God and we have to believe in Him and Him alone because our situations and life and death and pain are never going to bring us comfort. They're never going to make sense. Life happens. Things happen. Pain is a very natural part of life, but God is bigger and God is stronger and there is a hope that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And so I just want to encourage you today that if you feel hopeless and you walk in day in and day out in your life, that there is hope in Christ. You just look up and there is a God who loves you and a God who will keep you. And I have known great healing in my life. I have seen my mother come from wanting to commit suicide to making great leaps and is becoming a woman of God. And she longs for the things of God. My dad is is now celebrating a year of sobriety. And I praise God that he is where he is. Jesus. But I, I must tell you, things are not perfect. All is, is not completely perfect, but God is faithful. And I believe, and I even believe for each one of you here, that little by little, step by step, God is going to change you and he will restore your family. He will give you life and he will keep you. You cry out to him and you just know that he's walking with you and he will be everything that you need. <clears throat> wow, what a... What an honor it is to be asked to share my testimony with all of you. My name is Brad Geis. I came to New York City when I was 23 years old. Right out of college, I came to New York to be a photographer, and I came to New York to seek fame and fortune. And I got it. I got it really fast. It was like unbelievable. My first week that I had a photo studio, I had three national ad campaigns and it didn't stop. It was unbelievable. Um, People started talking about me in the ad community. I had articles written about me in photo magazines and photo journals, and uh, everybody wanted to work with me because I was like the new kid on the block. And I started making money like crazy for a 23-year-old kid from California. I didn't know what to do with all this money, and and I wanted to ha- go out and have a social life, and I um, started going out at night, and I started clubbing with, with actors and socialites and models, and I had this dream life. And I, one night I tried cocaine, and at first I just loved it. It just gave me energy, and it gave me a, even more ability to go out later at night. And then one night I remember I was in this penthouse apartment, and I forget where, but it was a, this beautiful, mega, multi-million dollar penthouse apartment overlooking Manhattan. And there were all these people that were well-dressed socialites standing over a stove, cooking up cocaine, making free base and crack out of it. And that night I tried and I smoked crack for the first time, and my life became a living hell. I was instantly addicted. And 
it, my life plummeted almost as fast as it got, went up to the top. It can, it can fall just as fast down. People started like talking about me as though I was a, um, sharing that I was a drug addict. And I started spending so much of my money, like, like several thousand dollars a week I had a habit of. And I, um, I, I went away to drug rehab and I came back out and I relapsed immediately. And I went from being um, smoking in a penthouse apartment to, to going to crack houses. My life went to the bottom. I don't know if you know what a crack house is, but you don't want to go there. I did things I am not very proud of. I got beat up in, in back alleys. I was held up in gunpoint of my other addicts trying to steal the, the crack I had just bought. I um, have stole things. I have lied. I have done things, as I said, that I'm embarrassed to even admit to God about. Um, then my parents and family wrote a letter to me. And they said that they were disowning me as a child, a son. And they said they expected me to die as a drug addict. And when I read those words, I, I believed them because I expected myself to die as a drug addict. You see, I had no more hope. I was doing drugs five, six days in a row without getting any sleep. I was doing, to show, tell you what a drug addict is, I would like do things like, I would see the freckles on my arms and my legs and think they were live bugs underneath my skin. And I'd take a razor blade and I'd try and cut all the freckles off of me because I thought they were bugs eating me. I did things that were so crazy, I was losing my mind. And in the last couple weeks of my addiction, I had a photo shoot. And um, my addiction had gotten very strange at that point because I would, in my photo studio, which was a big place, 3,000 square feet, and I had tall ceilings, and I had a bedroom in the corner. When I'd get high in my bedroom, I'd see on this one wall where there was Backle, there was kind of unfinished wall. I'd, I would like be getting high and I'd see satanic symbols. And I swore I heard demonic voices talking to me. And I'd just shrug it off. And I had a photo shoot one day. And I needed, I hired models for it. And I needed a hair and makeup artist. And the hair and makeup artist I, I usually hired was not available. And I hired a makeup artist that was actually going to Times Square Church. And she had been told, coming into my studio, not to share about Jesus, because she had ruined her career almost by, by over telling everybody about the Lord. And um, lo and behold, she was running straight into a divine appointment with me. And it was all she could do to wait to the end of the day to come up to me and say, you know, Brad, I'd like to tell you about God, and I'd like to invite you to church. You have to understand that I had lost all hope. I had given up. I did not think that there was anything left for me. And as soon as she mentioned God, it was like, God! Wow, there is hope for me. God can heal me. God can do this. And so I said, okay, Maria, let's exchange phone numbers. And I, I promptly lost her phone number, but Maria would call me every single night, and she would pray for me. And we made an appointment that next Sunday that she would come. I said, Maria, you have to come and pick me up and take me to church because I knew I couldn't get there on my own. And I tried everything to stay sober for her to come and get me, and I couldn't. That, night, that day, I got high, and when she rang my doorbell, I was shaking and, sh and scared and crying. I was in the fetal position in the corner of my loft, and I was so much an addict. The drug had me as a slave. 
And when she stopped ringing the doorbell, I just thought it was all over for me. But she didn't give up. She kept calling me. The next Sunday, we made the same appointment. The same thing happened again. That night, I was all alone. And I'm telling you, I thought that was it. You see, I couldn't even get to God. My last hope was God, and I couldn't get to him. And that night I passed out. The next morning I had a photo shoot. It was a Monday. I had another photo shoot, and was, all I could do was to get through the day and chase my assistants out of the photo studio. And, and I went into my bedroom to count how much money I had to see how many drugs I could go buy. And um, I heard the demonic voices. And I looked up at the wall, and I was like seeing the satanic symbols, and I started to cry. I started to tremble. And I, and I did something that um, I, I even surprised myself. I just cried out with all my heart to God. And I said, God, God, please tell me you're real. I've always believed in you. God, if you're real right now, prove it to me. Show me where Maria's phone number is. I lost it, God. Help me find it. And in the next second, I had this peace come over me, and I felt God lead me to stand up, walk into my photo studio area, go to a box in the corner. I opened up the box, and there was my phone book with Maria's phone number in it. I was standing there, and I was like, God, you just answered me. In the next second, the Holy Spirit came down on me. God came down on me, and it was the most warmest, most wonderful feeling I've ever had in my entire life. And um, I, I had my eyes closed, and I want to say that he, I heard him say, open up your eyes and just always believe in me. And uh, I, I want to tell you that the room was bright with light, and it lasted about 30 seconds or so. And um, I was standing there when it ended, and I thought I'd gone insane, <laughs> actually, to tell you the truth. I, I'd been seeing satanic symbols in my bedroom, and now God had just visited me out here. I grabbed Maria's phone number, went to my, my phone, and, um, and I um, called Maria, and she wasn't home. And I was sitting there just scared to death because now... There's a spiritual battle happening right there in front of me. And um, I, I looked across my studio space. And there, I had done, it sounds like I'm on a sidetrack now, but I had done a campaign for, um, a, 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 I had done this charity campaign, photo campaign for an organization in the United States. And it had been, used all over the United States on anti-racism. And it had come out in God's perfect timing at a point when, when there was race riots, actually, in the United States. And I'm staring at this. They, the organization had given me this billboard. I had actually put it up on my wall. So I'm looking at this 8-foot by 30-foot billboard on my wall. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Brad, I used you to execute my will on anti-racism. And I, was, I looked at those, that billboard and I remembered I had framed pictures from that photo shoot. And I got this idea that I wanted to grab those two framed pictures and go back into my bedroom where I was seeing the satanic symbols. So I got to my feet and I went to my tool chest. And this was only a minute after the Holy Spirit had come down. And I fell to my knees, and I said, God, I'm a drug addict. I can't stop doing drugs. I have no more hope. I have no more willpower. I, I, I need you, God. I got to my feet. I got to the tool chest. I reached in, pulled a hammer out, pulled out two nails, and the nails fell perfectly pointed to the inside part of my palm. And um, 
It just made me think of Jesus on the cross. And in the next second, the Holy Spirit touched me again. And I heard him loud and clear as he said, Brad, you don't have to say no to drugs anymore. I'll say no for you. I died for your sins. That was um, April 29th, 1991. Now, um, I, I had to confront a lot of people and ask forgiveness. I it was in major debt. I had a lot of things that I had to deal with. Came out of my drug addiction, but um, God has been incredibly faithful. And uh, also, the next day was a Tuesday. I made it to Times Square Church and ran up to the altar call. <laughs> What a pleasure it's been to be here with you in uh, Green Ox, Scotland again, and to experience that, that hymn was so special tonight. Thank you so very, very much. Praise God for that. I, I felt as if uh, when you sang that tonight, we were being taken back in time. It was a kind of a strange feeling. It's as if I could hear other voices singing these same songs from many, many years back. And the, the, the wonderful thing is that you, you were not singing it with dullness, as can happen in the church, but you were singing it with a profound feeling in the heart, which I think is the, is the tenure of the Scottish church. It always has been. And I praise God for that, that sound, that song that was heard in the sanctuary tonight. I'm just so thankful tonight. I see all of the choir are dressed up in their finest, and a lot of the folks in the uh, choir tonight are, are dressed with the um, clothing from their native countries. I don't know how many nations are represented in this choir tonight. Would it be safe to say 40? Would that be safe? 40. That's 40 different nations singing together with one voice. Praise God for that. I want to thank Greg Thomas, wherever he's gone to. Probably gone in the back, but I, want, I do want to thank him publicly because he's got more energy than any man I've ever known in my entire life, and great, great creative ability to put all this together. Please give him, uh, just give him uh, your appreciation. And all of the band, all the orchestra, and everybody that's come here, what a pleasure it's been to fellowship with you tonight, and uh, this week I mean to, and to be here again tonight, just to fellowship this is only a foretaste of heaven. It's a, it's a slight little foretaste when every nation, every tongue, every kindred, every tribe, we're going to be gathered together round about the throne of God. And if you have any reservation to worship tonight, you will not have any reservation there, I guarantee you. The reservation and all of the trappings of this life are going to be gone. All of the garb that we pick up is going to be discarded. We're going to be completely of one mind and one heart before the throne of God. What a, what a marvelous time that will be. Tonight the Lord's put a message on my heart that is, uh, I, I'm hoping and believing will, um, the people clapped for you by the way, Greg, when you were gone, they gave it, <laughs> just so that you know. <laughs> you can get your picture taken with Greg after the service tonight. <laughs> Five cents, a great deal in Scotland. You'll be really appreciated. <laughs> Why should I turn from sin? Father, I thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, we don't come here with a program. We don't come with strength of our own. We come here with a total, complete dependence on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, our only right to stand and to sing and to proclaim anything is because you have come to us in mercy. You have redeemed us out of every nation, tribe, and tongue, and kindred. You've called us your own. Then you've commissioned us to stand as witnesses of the fact that you are alive from the dead. And so I come in obedience to you tonight, Lord, to do this. But God, I would never dare do it in my own strength. I don't possess the strength to do this. It has to be you. You have to override the frailties of this body the naturalness of this mind, and you have to gift me, O oh God, that I can cause the people's hearts, Lord, to want to hear. 
I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to go ahead of me. And Father, encompass me and move upon our hearts tonight, O God, in this simple message. Give us the grace to understand these things. In Jesus' name. I'm going to read to you from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Why should I turn from sin? Now, lest anybody thinks that you are going to escape tonight, this is a message for the church as well as for those who don't know Christ yet as Lord and Savior. Why should I turn from sin? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Why should I turn from sin? Now let me first define sin according to what I read in the scriptures. Sin is a willful decision to embrace a practice or a way of living which God says is wrong. And it's to reject both the pathway and the power that's clearly set before you in Christ to do that which God says is right. It's a willful decision. There's nobody living in sin who has a lawful right before a holy God to say there's no way out of this. For God has made a way out of it. We get into sin and sinful situations because we make the choice to live in sin. It's a free will choice to sin against God. Sin was infused into the human race when our first parents, Adam and Eve, they consciously decided to defy what God had spoken and instead pursued what they thought would bring them happiness and fulfillment. And that's what sin is. When we know what truth is, but we make a conscious decision to become our own God, to chart our own course, determine our own destiny, to become the arbitrators as it is of what is right and what is wrong. And we begin to justify wrong and sometimes even go to the extent of condemning right. Didn't the prophet Isaiah say that? And we're living in that type of an hour, especially in the United States of America today, when evil is being called good and good is being called evil. Abominable practices, according to the scriptures, are being called acceptable, social, and normal. And there's a pointing of the finger now to everything that represents God and truth as being somehow abhorrent, somehow against the goodness of social order and the social agenda in our society. And America is quickly turning from God. I pray that in our country as well as in Scotland that we don't make that tragic mistake of thinking that we can chart another course and somehow ever prosper in that course. The wages of sin, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, is death. Sin still pays the same wages it always had. Death comes to everything. Death touches everything. Death to your mind, death to your spirit, death to your heart, death to your ambitions, death to your home, death to your family. Death to everything you touch, death to everything you speak. The wages of sin is death. It is the fruit of death. It is, it is the payment for rebellion against a holy God and separation from all that God intended your life to be. Did you know that tonight that God has a marvelous plan for everybody here? A marvelous plan. It's a plan that should be making your life a, a wonderment and a praise in the earth. We're not called to be ordinary as Christians. We're called to be extraordinary, not in ourselves, but by the power of God. Carried through situations like you heard about tonight, this young lady that testified. Carried through situations by God that should crush an ordinary child. That should take away all hope and bring an everlasting despondency and unforgiveness and bitterness in the heart that affects every relationship now and in the, in the days to come. But yet, in the power of Christ upon a six-year-old child, we heard it tonight. This young lady is now evolving into everything that God has intended her life to be because of a choice to do what is right and to shun what is wrong. In the book of Genesis, in just six short chapters, I'm just gonna go through it very, very quickly, just a few verses, we're gonna see what sin does. It only took six chapters in Genesis from the time that sin entered into the human race to the point where man's thoughts became continually only evil in Genesis chapter six. And the Lord destroyed the earth except for Noah and his family. Genesis 3, 7 tells us that sin takes away a sense of, being, of well-being and acceptance with God. 
Adam and Eve, it says, the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The moment you sin, a sense of well-being is lost. The first time a young person enters into casual sex outside of marriage, there's something that comes into the spirit. There's something that comes to even those who have never had any religious training, that they begin to realize that something is not right. I've lost something. Something of virtue, something that was created right has been made wrong. There's that inner sense. There's a, there's a separation from God. and That sense of well-being is gone. Chapter 3, verse 10 tells us that sin brings shame and hiding. They told, Adam said to God, when I heard your voice in the garden, I was afraid because I was naked and I went and hid myself. We become afraid of people. We become afraid of the dark. We become afraid of life. We become afraid of circumstance, situation, and ultimately afraid of God. Afraid of ever coming into the presence of a holy God because we feel so dirty, so ashamed, and so unworthy. Sin brings sorrow, a deep feeling of unsatisfaction, no matter how much effort we put into finding something of lasting satisfaction from the ground beneath our feet. Listen to what God said to Adam and Eve. He said unto the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall have the rule over thee. Unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, dust you are, and out and dust unto dust you shall return. Sin, bring, sin brings sorrow. And this deep sense of unsatisfaction, no matter how much we try to work, no matter how we sweat, that's what God was telling Adam. Go out. Go to every field you can find in this world and work hard and sweat as much as you can. But it still will not bring forth to you what I gave you in my presence, what you once had. You will never get it back. Try everything. Try success. Try business. Try influence. Try fame. Try money. Try, try drugs. Try alcohol. Try anything you want. Achieve anything that man can achieve. Circle the globe 50 times and looking for it. And in the sweat of your brow, it still will produce thorns and thistles. That means things that will be pain in your sides. They will never satisfy. Scratch the ground all you want, Adam. As Adam is leaving that garden, as a, a flaming sword as it is, is put in the Garden of Eden, guarding the tree of life. He can't come back to it. He's lost it. And man now is, is relegated to circling this grove and circling and circling and circling and scratching the earth and building castles and trying to find something and some substance in the earth to satisfy. But the Lord said, work all you want, but it will never satisfy you. You will never, you'll, you'll die. If you become a rich man, you'll die worried about who's going to inherit your money. It will never satisfy you. Never. Sin brings separation for time and eternity from what God had intended your life to be. It says, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed it to eat east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And these folks are our parents. They're your parents and they're my parents, driven from the presence of God because of sin. Now all of a sudden, in the next chapter, we see the fruit of sin beginning to be manifested, not only in Adam and Eve, but in their family. Sin brings envy and murder. Genesis chapter four, verse five says, unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why are you wroth? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? If you do not well, sin lies at the door. He said unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Sin brings envy and murder. That's why envy and murder is in the land today. It's because of sin. It's not because of all the nice trappings we want to call it. It's not because of social meltdown. It's not because of the disintegration of the family. There are, yes, these are all byproducts, but go farther, go farther, go back, go deeper. It's because of sin. It's because of rebellion against a holy God and the ways of God. 
Sin brings lies and indifference. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? I often wonder sometimes, is that why Cain's sacrifice was rejected? Is it, was it possibly because he knew that in this man's heart he really didn't care about his brother? You ever go to church sometime and is it possible you're feeling like your, your praises are, are not going anywhere? That you're offering a sacrifice of praise and God is not accepting it? Is it possible? Is it possible because that sacrifice is incomplete? Is it possible that sin lies at the door? Is it possible that, that we can't legitimately come into the presence of God and say, you are mine, Christ, and I am yours. I have your heart, you have my heart. And the Lord says, well, where's your brother then? Well, how do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Where are the children in your streets that are committing suicide? Why are they, why are they not in your fellowship? Where are they? You know, the Bible says in the New Testament, if any man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, if you go back, if you go into the original text of the Greek New Testament, the word hate also has in it the connotation of indifference. Now, put that in the scripture. If any man says, I love God, and is indifferent towards his brother, the love of God is not in him. Where is your brother? How do we say that we are worshiping God and we are children of God and have the heart of God and don't care if people around us go to hell? That's not possible. Now, I don't live with a gloominess. I, I'm a happy Christian, actually. I don't live with a gloominess in my heart. But I live with a constant awareness that people around me are going to perish one day and be cast away everlastingly from the presence of a holy God into torment for all of eternity. I am aware that Christ died for them. I'm aware that the Christ in me loves them with a passionate love. I'm aware that the God in me can make a difference. I'm aware they don't have to go to hell as long as God is alive in me. I'm aware of it. And when I come into the sanctuary, yes, I thank God for what he's done. Yes, I thank God for his presence. I thank God for the church. I thank God for my family. But I thank God for what he's going to do in the future. I thank God that kids in New York City are not going to hell on my watch. We have 800 young people now coming out on Friday night and God's glory is touching them. That will soon turn into 8,000 by the grace of Almighty God. Sin turns life into death. It brings into your life and mind that which should never have been. He says to Cain, now you're cursed from the earth which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield to thee your strength. And a, future, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. You know why so many Christians wander around looking for God all over the world? I often wonder, is, it, is that what you spoke to Cain? You'll be a vagabond and a fugitive. You'll never ever understand what this life is all about. Is it simply because there's a refusal to recognize that we have a brother in need. That so many people are just seem to be on this incredible treadmill of looking for some new touch from God, but ignoring where that life is supposed to bring us. Undealt with sin, Genesis chapter six. Now we're only in six chapters in the Old Testament and mankind has already come to a place where God can't take it any longer. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. And that's where sin leads to. If sin is not dealt with, it leads to a continuous evil in the heart and a final and forever banishment from the presence of the Lord. Why should I turn from sin? Now, all I've done thus far is define what sin is and what sin does. And so I want to go back to the original question. Why should I turn from sin? Number one, that God loves you. And God so loved you that he became sin, according to the scriptures, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God loves you. And no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your story is, you, you can be as far down the ladder as Brad talked about tonight. And 
God came to that man sovereignly, supernaturally came and gave him the revelation of who he was because in his heart he cried out. You should turn from sin because God loves you. You have an opportunity to be righteous. You have an opportunity for cleansing. You and I have an opportunity to walk with the Holy God. We have an opportunity to enter into a supernatural life according to the scriptures. He offers drink to satisfy the deepest longing and thirst of your heart. In John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, the scripture says at the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his inward part shall flow rivers of living water. Are you thirsty? Have you not been satisfied? He's talking to a religious crowd, folks. They've just, they've just been finished celebrating the goodness of God, just as we have this week. They've just, they're at the end of the feast. The goodness of God has been celebrated. Testimonies have been told. They've discussed the past, how good God was, how he brought us out, how we dwelt in tents, how he fed us, how he clothed us, how he delivered us. I'm sure they're clapping their hands. The trumpets are blowing. Great things are happening. But at the very end, Jesus stands and says, if this is not enough, if all of this celebration hasn't satisfied the deepest longing of your heart, then come to me and drink. I'll not deny you. I'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. And out of your inward parts shall flow a river of living water. I heard these scriptures as a young man when I couldn't preach. I couldn't put three words together if you nailed them on a board and held them up in front of me. But I saw this promise in the scriptures and I came to Christ and said, God, I'm thirsty. I'm not satisfied to sit in a church and just sing hymns out of a book the rest of my life. I want you to use me for your glory. You said you'd fill me. Fill me, God. Let your word come from my inward parts like a river of living water. We're promised to be indwelt by Christ, to be fully satisfied, and to be brought into the power of an endless life. Paul said in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God, my God, my God, I've lived this. I know this to be true. I've known his power. I've walked with him. I've just taken him at his word. He's taken me through door after door after door of impossibility. And people on this platform know this. And many in the sanctuary know this as well today. This is a supernatural life. Young men, young women here today, you don't have to figure this out. You come to God. God will begin to do it through you. He will guide you. He will lead you. He'll be that voice behind you says, this way, walk this way. He'll be the power that goes before you and opens every door. And it's all for the glory of God and the souls of men. That's the only cry of my heart now. The only thing left in me. The only thing I want of life. I have a lovely wife. I have a wonderful family. I have incredible grandchildren. I pastor a big church, but that doesn't satisfy me. I want the rest of my life to glorify God and to glorify God by bringing home the souls of men. To see a church revived in the earth. To see God's people brought back out of captivity. Enough stomping bricks. Enough building buildings for men's egos. It's time to walk with God in the miraculous power again. In Christ, you become the person God intended you to be. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I leave behind yesterday. Thank God for yesterday, but yesterday is gone. I live in today and tomorrow is just coming around the bend. I leave those things behind, as wonderful as they may have been. I'm not resting on past victory. This is a present Christ that I serve. He's already in my tomorrow. He already knows where my feet should be going. He's already planned the miraculous. He's already intending on delivering people from bondage. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. Hallelujah. You become a person of truth and compassion. Romans 5, 5, Paul said, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Everything changes. The old nature is put away. 
and the new nature given by God comes into the heart and takes over. Before I was a Christian, I couldn't care less about people. I didn't like people. I used to go through the supermarket with my wife, Teresa, with a shopping cart. And I remember one time telling her, I hate people. I especially hated motorcycle gang members because I'd had some really bad dealings with them as a police officer. Then after I got saved, such a strange thing. I never decided to love anybody. I just decided to love God. And God's love began to be shed abroad in my heart. And it's a strange feeling when you start loving people you should hate. And God began to deal with the depths in my heart of what needed to be taken away. There were people that needed to be forgiven in my life. I remember one time, I was saved for two years. And I, I had a kind of a, I wasn't living in sin, but I wasn't fully living for God. I was, I was all gusto in the church. Many of you know that, that that's about. I could sing the hymns as good as anybody in church, open my hymn book, and can it be that I should gain? He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. Then I'd be out on the street with my police buddies and I'd see a Christian coming and oh my God, I'd be looking for a sewer hole to climb in. I remember one time I was at a shopping mall with some other policeman doing some work and a Christian man that I knew who had been an ex-con saw me and came and grabbed me and hugged me and lifted me right off the ground and spun me around in the mall. I, I, I'm in uniform, I have a gun on my side and he's spinning me around and I was so embarrassed and the other guys are looking at me like, whoa. You know, you, you know what they were thinking. You know what they were thinking. I knew what they were thinking and it was just really not good but I got so tired of it all I cried out to God I said oh Jesus I want to serve you if it kills me and I don't care if it kills me I want to serve you with all my heart and the Lord led me deeper into his presence touched me with his spirit guided me into the places where I never dreamed I would ever go ever I got an invitation to speak at a Christian bikers conference and, you know, I, don't, I, I, I normally would never have gone to it. And uh, I, was, I was really debating this, and I thought, well, I'll go. And uh, so I, I went to, you know, Christian bikers, uh, these are kind of motorcycle wannabes, most of them. You know, guys with big bellies that work in, in offices that get, a, get a, a motorcycle, and they, they grow a beard, and they get, all, they get an attitude, and they drive around for the weekend, you know. <laughs> you know? And I really didn't want to be there because they're all living in unreality. And I just, I thought, oh, oh. so I felt the goal. So I, I pull into this address and there, and when I pulled in, there's really, really big bikes there, choppers. I mean, incredible motorcycles. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of money going into these things. Then I come around the backyard and there's a whole bunch of guys there wearing colors. Like they're not saved yet, a lot of them. There's, there's outlaws and hell's angels and who knows what else. There was another group called the Popeyes, I think, in, in Canada. And these are real deal bikers that I had had so much trouble with for so many years. And, but some of them were Christians and they had organized this event and they had invited them to come. And here I am, a cop, in uniform, coming to speak to people that we we're doing our utmost to put behind bars for life. And God started dealing with my heart. I saw tears. I saw men and women destroyed by sin, who under the preaching of the gospel began just simple testimony of what God was doing in my life. I saw that there was a hunger in them that had never been satisfied, that they were just another manifestation of sin. I began to understand that they're no more obnoxious to God than the proud man in a religious meeting. All have sinned, and the Lord through many, many, many situations like this. As a cop, I was invited into a penitentiary for sex offenders, uh, a high-risk penitentiary, and I was brought into a room with about as many sex offenders as there are people here today, about 700 or so, and had to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the amazing tears, the amazing weeping that came into that room when the simple message that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God was given to these men in this room and, and they shook and they cried and 
came, many of them came forward and responded and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And the Lord just through all of these things began to just lead me on a pathway of, of, of understanding that you and I become persons of truth and compassion. We're, we're not led by Christ into an obnoxious, hard religion. That is not the Spirit of God that leads us into these places where we become rigid, dogmatic, and it's all because, it, well, it's all becomes about the exterior, about dress and about uh, circumstance and about pomp and how we do things. And, and it, it's, it becomes a rigid thing that has no love in it. If Christ is in it, we are constrained by the Spirit of God and move towards human need in all of its forms, in every place you find it. I was locked in Sullivan Prison years ago with 60 men who will never get out of jail, there for life, most of the murderers. I was locked in a room with them, with a trumpet player then from our church, his name was Angelo, and somebody else, a couple of other musicians, and two guards that weren't armed. And I stood up in front of these men and said, I, look, I'm an ex-cop. And as soon as I said that, Angelo, the trumpet player, who had come from the Brooklyn, he said, uh-oh, I said, right behind me. Uh, <laughs> As if you shouldn't have said that. This is a real bad place to say this because we're locked in here and these guys, they've got nothing to lose. They're never getting out. But I carried on by saying, look, I'm not here because I have nothing better to do. And I'm not a do-gooder. I'm here because I've been, I was a sinner who's been saved by grace and God has filled my heart with love for you. And that day, after sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, there was the whole front of that room was, was probably, I'm, only, I'm, I'm guessing maybe 15 men lined up most of them, and when I reached out and I hugged each one of them, they'd come to Christ, they'd responded to be saved, and I reached out and hugged them, and to a man, they began to weep and cry. Each one, hard, hard, some of them, having survived by being hard, having, having, living in prison by being hard. David Berkowitz was there, the son of Sam. I don't know if you know, ever heard of that. He, he murdered quite a few people in New York City, held the city in terror for, for quite a period of time. He's now a born-again, spiritual Christian. He leads worship. In the church, in this penitentiary, he weeps. He was leading worship. He was weeping before God. This former mass murderer has come to Christ, and it's genuine. It's a real conversion. I don't care what the papers say. This is a brother in Christ. He has come to God. His testimony was, this, the devil made me what I became. He got involved in the occult after serving in Vietnam, was, became demon-possessed, went out and heard voices telling him to begin to kill people in their cars, and he obeyed these voices. And his testimony is, I became what the devil told me that I was going to be and going to do. But today, I am what Christ originally intended me to be. He has had his throat cut in prison, but he still goes on. And you know what he does? He ministers to prisoners who come in, and they're so bruised, they're so hurt, they're so abused, they can't dress, they can't bathe, they can't even brush their own teeth, they can't comb their hair. And he does that for them. He combs the hair of these prisoners, he brushes their teeth, he helps them, he dresses them, he bathes them. That's what this man of God that formerly was a murderer is doing today. Blessed be God is all I can say. Blessed be God. <laughs> and lastly, the scripture says that death is turned into life. Wherever we were living in death, we start be living in life. Psalm 40. David says it this way, he brought me up out of a horrible pit. Now let me start at verse one. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. And he brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God and many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Death is turned into life. A new song comes, and it's not, he's not talking about a chorus that we sing in church. It's the song of our life. It's the sweet song that comes from within. David said, I, I was taken out of a horrible pit. And so many young people, so many here today, you need to be taken out of this horrible pit because you're living in the wrong place. You're producing nothing or very little for your effort. Futility and frustration is a common part of your life. You're, you're cut off from the life that God wants to give you. And you're singing a song of sorrow and a song of despair and a song of violence, a song of anger, a song of, of wanting to get high, to get out, a song of false love in all of your relationships. You're singing the wrong song. And if there's even a minimal cry in your heart, just a part of a cry, God will hear it. He'll take you out of this place you're in and give you a new song. Because he promises, according to the scriptures in Ezekiel, he said, I'll give you a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit. Behold, he said, I make all things new. 
He doesn't leave us all. Now Haley said tonight, and I agree, it doesn't happen all at one time, but it is happens, it's line upon line. A song is not all written. You don't sit down on the piano and poof, a song comes out. It's written line by line, note by note, but eventually it's finished and it begins to be sung. When you come to Christ, death loses its power. Death is turned to life. What happened in the Garden of Eden is canceled by the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Death, the scripture says, is swallowed up in victory. Praise be to God. You're not coming to a concept about God. It's not a mental agreement about God. It's a living relationship with a living God who says, I will come to you. I will live inside of you. I will recreate you from the inside out. Scotland, rise to the occasion. Church of Jesus Christ, rise to the occasion. The hour is dark, yes it is dark, but Christ is still the light of the world. The power of evil still roams our streets, but the power of God is greater. Enough death to our children. Enough dying in our streets. Enough violence and drugs and poverty. It's time for the church to rise. It's time for young people to lay hold of your inheritance that God's given you. Stop wasting your life in places that are never going to satisfy. He's given me a new song. Hallelujah. He's given you a new song. If you come to Christ, you have a new song. Why should I turn from sin? I guess a better question would be, why would I stay in sin? What is the point? It's like a man who's just hitting himself on the head with a hammer and asking, why should I stop? It's just as stupid to stay in sin when you can be free. You can have life. You can have a hope, a future. You don't have to pass on to your children what was passed on to you. That chain can be broken. You can have a new family, a new life, a new heart, a new mind. And nobody, will, you, you won't have to prove the existence of God to anybody. If anybody wants an argument with you, you don't have to argue with them. A Muslim came to me one time after a prayer meeting. He said, how dare you say that Christ is the only way? How dare you make such a bold declaration? Now, first of all, what was he doing in our prayer meeting? I have no idea, but he was there. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, would you give me five minutes? And then I'll give you five minutes. I said, I want to tell you what God has done for me. And in five minutes, I told him several things that God had done for me. I said, you see, because the proof is in the pudding. Everybody can claim to have the right formula, but the proof's in the pudding. It's when you taste it. Remember David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So I shared for five minutes what God had done for me. And I said, now what has Allah done for you? And he just looked at me with tears in his eyes and he couldn't answer me. You see, because Allah had done nothing for him. There is only one way to everlasting life. There is only one God. And David says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's why I should turn from sin. And tonight, if you've got sin in your life, can I encourage you? If you're a Christian, it may not be separating you from eternity, but it is separating you from the life that God wants to give you. And you need to turn from it. If you're a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, sin is separating you from God altogether. But the good news is that God is not willing to be separate from you. That's why he came to the earth. That's why he became a man. That's why he died on the cross. He wants you back to himself again. He passionately loves you. He didn't die because he felt a legal obligation to redeem you. He died because he loves you. God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Tonight, you have an opportunity to turn from sin. And he promises, if you turn, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will change you. You will have a new heart. You, you saw it. Now, I, we, we couldn't put a clearer sermon illustration than Haley and Brad here tonight. I'll give you a new mind. I'll give you a new heart, a new hope, a new future. That's what God says I will, he will do. That's his part. Your part, my part, is to admit that we need a savior and say, God, I've been in this place long enough, but tonight I'm out of here. I'm going with you, Lord. And oh God, I thank you with all my heart that you've given me the promise of a new life, a new hope, and a new song. If that's you tonight, in a moment we're going to rise to our feet and we're going to sing a chorus. And when we, as we sing it, I'm going to ask you, in Christ's name, to get out of your seat and make your way to the front of this sanctuary. Or this is a sanctuary tonight because the word of God is being preached here. But make your way to the front of the sanctuary right here in front of me. And we're going to pray a simple prayer. And you can walk out of here free from sin. You can walk out of here with a new burden. If you're a Christian, you can walk out of here with a new burden for the lost. You can be free from maybe something that's gotten a hold of you because of a spiritual dullness in your life. Something has, has grabbed a hold of you. It can happen to any of us. There's no, there's no shame to admit your sin, but there is a shame to stay in sin. If you need freedom from something that's besetting you, you've, you've gotten sir on the internet and you're, you went to websites you shouldn't go to and you're hooked now and you can't get free. It's taking away your very life. You need to be here tonight. You need to get right with God. And he will respond to you by giving you back his heart and his eyes, his vision, his burden, and his song. I stake my life on this word tonight. I stake my life on this promise. We're going to stand. And as we do, if you have a neighbor beside you that may have come with you that maybe is afraid to make that step, and if you're a Christian person who's living right for God, or at least wanting to live right for God, you can turn to your neighbor and say, are you saved? Do you know Christ as Savior? Do you need to respond to this? And you can help that person by coming with them so they don't have to walk down here alone. Sometimes it can be a hard thing to do. Father, I thank you, Lord, that this is a miraculous hour for Greenock, Scotland. And I pray, God, you do something so profound in this sanctuary tonight. Lord, break the backbone of sin. Break the deadness and dullness of, of religion that is compromised. And God, bring home, Lord, those who need to come back to you. We thank you for this with all my heart, in Jesus' name. Now let's stand together. If the Lord is drawing you, come, just come unashamedly. Come and meet me here, please. Step out, follow this young lady who's on her way already. This gentleman and his wife, perhaps over here. Just follow these people that are coming. Just come, please, all the way down. From the balcony, make your way to the exit. Turn to your neighbor. Would you turn to your neighbor Just say, do you need to come? Do you need to go? Let's go together. Maybe you're a couple of Christians together and you've just lost your passion for God altogether. And you say, I don't know, but I just feel I need something that's here tonight. You step out. Don't be ashamed. Just make your way. We're going to pray together. We're going to believe God together. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you just rest just for a moment in the, in the Lord's presence, I'd like to sing an old hymn of the church the Lord put on my heart today. And as we sing this, I know, I know there's somebody else here tonight in the sanctuary that this is really your moment. You're, you're very nervous right at the moment. Your heart is pounding because that's the Holy Spirit is calling you. This, this is a defining moment of your life. You will not regret coming down here. You're not, you're not coming to something that's going to make uh, you uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, it's going to release you from all your pain. You, you, you will know God lives because you will have a sense in your heart that things have changed. The day after I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I woke up. The day, the, the day I did give him my life, I didn't feel a thing, nothing. But as God lives, the next morning I woke up, I sat on the edge of my bed, and I knew God had changed me. I knew I was a different man. There was a change. Something had happened inside of me, and I knew it. 
And for those that are wavering just at this moment, even if it's just one more person, we'll take that time and wait for you tonight. You're that important to God that we will wait for you to come tonight. I, I feel it's a young man. And uh, young man is in, anybody under 50. When you get to be my age, you're a young man. <laughs> but you're here tonight, and you're just wavering. Is this possible? Could this be real? And, and what will it cost me to do this? Well, it, it costs you nothing. It costs you everything not to do this. Just think of the cost of not coming to God, not just for time, but forever. It's, there's no cost to coming to Christ. It, it's, you're, winning, you're winning the lottery when you come to Christ, literally. You're, you're getting the, the treasure of heaven, salvation, and the life of God given to you. And, and all you're losing is what sin has in store for you for the rest of your life and forever. You're, you're not, there's no cost to this whatsoever. You, get, you come. It's an old hymn of the church, I believe it's written by Charles Wesley. You probably know it. And can it be that I should gain? I think we have the words on the screen. I hope we do. If, if the words do come up, would you sing it with me? Uh, I'm not going to sing all the verses. Just, uh, just one and three and uh, four. How's that? I sound, I sound like a Presbyterian minister all of a sudden, don't I? All right. All right. If you'll open your hymn books, we're going to sing verses one, three, and all right. And can it be that I should gain? Can we have a, some kind of music? <laughs> you, will, you will never regret this decision the rest of your life. You will never regret what you're doing tonight. You'll be cleansed, you'll be changed, you'll be forgiven, you'll be given a new heart and a new mind. You'll never be the same again. Never, 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 never be the same again. Praise God. Lord, young man, the Lord's going to put his hand on you. He's going to use you for his glory because he waited for you tonight, just for you. He waited for you. He, he knew something about you. Pray a simple prayer with me right now, would you please? God bless you. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you and against my fellow men. I'm sorry for my sin, and I don't want to live in sin anymore. I thank you tonight, Lord Jesus, that you died for me, that I might be free from the chains, the power, and the penalty of sin. You became sin, that I might become as clean as a God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, tonight I open my heart to you. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I give you the right to the rest of my life. I trust you and I believe you that you will change me and you will give me a new song and give me the power to be a different person, the kind of person that brings honor to your name in this world. You will change me. Oh God, I love you with as much as my heart as I can. And I thank you for receiving me as your very own. I believe that at this moment, my sins are washed away. And should I die, I'm going to be going to heaven. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Those, those of you who are here at the altar, would you please just follow this young man? Would you wave? Would you wave your hand? Now, this young man who's waving his hand is going to be preaching in Port Glasgow tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and he has an incredible anointing. You want to hear him. You want to be there. I've, I've just heard him pray last night, and my, I, I leaned over to my wife, and I said, I, I think he should preach and not me. There's an anointing on this young man. You want to hear him tomorrow night. Port Glasgow, I'm going to hear him. So you come and hear him as well. Just follow him into that room, if you will, for just a moment. They're going to pray with you, give you a Bible. Just do that. You'll be safe there. If they cause you any trouble, you yell. We'll come help you, okay? <laughs> God bless.
This is a wonderful night. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. We need to rejoice. We got 10 minutes to go. Let's rejoice. Let's take 10 minutes and rejoice before God. Let's give him thanks for what he has done tonight. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The next service. You mean, let's give these guys another back hand, shall we? Why don't we just take our seats for a moment? Well, I've been given the hardest job in the house tonight. Uh, my job is to give the vote of thanks. And that's a difficult job because I'm not really sure that words can fully express the depths of gratitude that we have for the team from Times Square Church from New York that have traveled all the way from Manhattan to Inverclyde to help us preach the good news of Jesus to our community. This week, there have been teams that have went into our schools and preached the gospel of Jesus. This week, teams have went into our nursing homes and ministered love and compassion and peace and given the message of eternal security to the elderly within our community. This week in our mall, the name of Jesus has been worshiped and glorified and preached. This week in healing rooms, the, the sick of our community have been prayed for. This week up at the Haven, there's been construction work to help men and young men to break free from the cords of addiction. Teams have been out on the teen challenge buses ministering to the, to the poor and to those in need. This week, throughout the week, every night in our town hall, in the center of our community, the truth of the gospel of Jesus has been presented with power and lives have been saved and changed. Literally this week, our community has been saturated with the gospel of Jesus. And for that, we are indebted to you and we say thanks. And so to all the team from Times Square Church New York, we'd really like you to understand how we have perceived your visit here to our community. For generations, a cry has gone up from this land that has said, Lord, the fields are white unto harvest, but the workers are few. Would you send workers into the harvest field? God answered our prayer in you. You are an answer to our prayers. We have prayed for this community to be saturated with the gospel of Jesus. And this week we have seen what is merely the first fruits of our prayers. And so, on behalf of the Church of Inverclyde and the steering committee and whoever they all are, I would really like to say a deep thank you. And I wonder, Church of Inverclyde, people of Inverclyde, would you join me in honoring Pastor Carter, Pastor Teresa Conlon, Pastor Neil Rhodes and his wife, Nolene, the, the, the Times Square Church Gospel Choir led by Gregory Thomas and his worship team and all the volunteers from Times Square Church. Would you stand to your feet and with the best effort that you've got, honor these people. And now, now I just wonder if the Times Square Church would join us in standing to their feet and honoring the one who has been at work this week and giving glory to Jesus. Let's lift up the name of Jesus and celebrate that the light is shining in the darkness of Inverclyde and it will never ever be put out that life is replacing death. Let's thank him for the great things that have been done in Inverclyde this week. Let's lift the roof, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 So Heavenly Father, we give you the glory and the honor and we exalt your name for all that you have done and all that you are going to do. 
We thank you that there is a hope and a future for Inverclyde in Scotland. We thank you that soon, oh very soon, the King of Glory will take up his position and take residence within our district and our nation. And Lord, today we roll out the red carpet and we declare, welcome King of Kings. Welcome Lord of Lords. Welcome Majesty. Be sovereign in our nation. Be sovereign in our community and our district. And we pray that the revival flames that are burning now, that Holy Spirit, you would continue to stalk them in the way that only you can, that they will burn bright and that they would consume the works of Satan in this land and usher in the kingdom of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I wonder if we could finish the service in a very traditional Scottish way. It's not overly spiritual or religious, but I'm sure God won't mind. I wonder if we could finish by singing, Should Old Acquaintance Be Forgotten? This is the way that we finish big events here in Scotland. Alistair's going to come up and grab this mic and sing it for us. And everybody here is going to help him out. And this song talks about not forgetting friendships that's been formed. And over this week, as we've been working with some of these guys, great friendships have been formed that we will last and cherish forever. So as we sing this song, we have a way of doing it here in Scotland. For the first verse and chorus, you grab the hand of the person on either side of you and you swing it. It's all very lovely. If the person's got sweaty hands, just ask them to wipe them down. All right. Now when we get to the second verse, can we get the words of the second verse up? The words of verse two up on the screen for this song, please. When we get to the second verse, it says, and here's a hand, my trusty fear. And you put your hand over like that and grab the hand of the person next to you. And give a hand of thine, and you cross it over, and you hold hands like that and you shake them up and down. Now the next line, can we bring it down? That, sec that second line says, and we'll take a good willy wacht. All right? American friends, I think you can say the word wacht. I don't have a clue what it means. But it's a good Scottish word, all right? So let's take it from the top. Should old acquaintance be forgot? You guys feel free to join us. Sure. 